But tell us a little bit about what your role is at Lincoln Park Zoo. You clearly are overseeing behavior and enrichment, but what does that mean for a large AZA accredited organization like Lincoln Park Zoo? Yeah, um, I so I'm overseeing the training program, which kind of entails not only kind of helping our keepers learn how to train and helping them improve and grow as trainers all the time. So I try to provide as much opportunity for them to have education experiences, um, but also coaching them and watching them um, reach goals that we're trying to reach with our animals. And that could either be me just watching them and telling them they're doing a great job or giving them suggestions on different ways that we could go about um, different training problems that we might be coming up with. Um, the other thing I kind of help with is if we have any behavioral concerns that are coming up. So if an animal decides that they don't want to move into a certain space that we need them to move into, um, then I can help with those types of problem behaviors as well. Um, and then on the flip side, I also help with the enrichment side of things. And enrichment um, entails a lot, and a lot of it is around safety. So the number one thing that I do is approve enrichment and make sure that it's going to be safe for our animals. Um, and that is a lot of different things that we have to take into account. Um, um, and each species has different rules and um, specifics that we have to pay attention to to make sure it's going to be safe for that animal. Um, and then the other thing that I do is help us really focus on why we enrich our animals. Um, so we really focus on natural behaviors and what types of behaviors we want our animals to do um, day to day. And so I help our keepers think of those goals. And then we come up with new ideas to try to give our animals the opportunity to practice natural behaviors each day. That's that's great. And by the way, while Allison was talking, uh, Sarah put a link there to the Lincoln Park Zoo website, as well as the link to a little information about Allison, if you're interested in that. And one of the things I want to put in context, Allison, is you're the very first uh, person to have this kind of position, but Lincoln Park Zoo has been around for a really long time, but that role was created sort of like we're seeing throughout the zoo community. For the longest time, there weren't people in positions like this at zoos, and we're beginning to see this happen in more and more zoos where someone is there specifically to watch training and watch enrichment. And that's really a great trend in our in our uh, in the zoological community, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that training and enrichment wasn't happening beforehand. Um, it's just having somebody who's a little bit more specialized to assist with the growth of the program, I think, is important. Yeah. And one of the things I'm always curious about is when, when you're in a position like that, where you're overseeing so many different species and looking at a lot of different things, what is it like working with areas and potential, that potentially don't usually do training? And so whether it's the reptile department or other areas where training has just not been a normal part of their of their world, is that challenging? Is that fun? Tell me a little bit about working with people who are new to training. Yeah, I mean, I think it's challenging and fun because it's it's fun to see people learn new things and um, grow and achieve things that they never thought were possible. Um, but it's also challenging um, because you're it's about changing culture and it's about changing people's opinions on things sometimes. Um, and obviously that can be a challenging job. Well, you know, one of the things I want to do right now, since you talked about that, I thought I would show one of the video clips that you provided. And this particular video clip is actually uh, of one of those areas that don't normally train. This is a dwarf caiman. And uh, I actually have two clips so you can see it from two different uh, perspectives. If you want to talk about what we're seeing as we watch it, by all means, Allison, tell us. Um, this, is, so this is our dwarf caiman. He um, we're working on getting him to go into Great that we built. Um, and the reason for that is so that we can help with procedures that we might need to do for him. Um, and so having him come into the crate, being comfortable coming into the crate, and then being comfortable with the door closing gives us a lot of opportunities. Um, we can blood samples if we want to from the tail eventually. We can uh, provide injections for him, whether that's the vaccine that we want to provide for him. Um, and then we can also eventually maybe even do some x-ray if needed for this animal, um, just by asking him to come into this crate and being comfortable with that door closing. Um, so, and this animal came very far in a very short period of time. And I really attribute that to our trainer's ability to really watch behavior um, and make great decisions on the environment that set this animal up for success. No, that's that's terrific. I, I turned the volume off because I thought it might be difficult for you to hear, but I did want you to hear the trainers are talking and they're banging a target. And one of the things that they're looking to see where the tail is positioned right now. And I, I thought I would share a, a second video here that actually shows it from 
the trainer's perspective. Uh, and so, um, um, how is that particular training going? You were saying that they use that for potential blood sampling and other just general medical uh, uh, exams. Is that right? Yeah. So um, this video you're going to see here is actually the first time or one of the first times that we started bringing him into this crate. Um, and so we're tr figuring things out. As you said, today is kind of an exploratory session. Um, and the training has been going fabulous. So um, he is very comfortable going to this crate, very comfortable with the door closing. And we've been working on tactile on the tail, which everybody thought would be a hurdle, um, but he actually was really comfortable with it right from the start, which was exciting. And, and was there much resistance to it? I mean, often when, when people think about training, they think, well, you train a dog, you train a dolphin, you maybe train a bird of prey, uh, but a reptile, were they resistant to it or was the team really excited to try it? This team in particular was super excited to try it and they were very passionate about it. And they actually drove a lot of this. Um, and so I was really proud of them and just seeing them making these really smart decisions um, made me feel very happy. <laughs> now, is I'm sure people watching it would be wondering, is there a risk? It doesn't look like there's anything protecting that, uh, that came in from coming out and, 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 and potentially biting the, uh, the, the, the keepers there. Yeah. I mean, there's always a risk when you're working with dangerous animals. Um, but these keepers are highly trained in working with this type of animal. And it, in that environment, there were a few things that we had as safety precautions to help in that situation. It's also about knowing your animal. And we knew that this particular animal was a little bit calmer and a very focused on the target. So we weren't too concerned, but we have changed it now um, to the door in the front is closed when he comes in and we have like a little portal um, that he can get his reinforcement through. So I would imagine that there, there has to be a number of people that review some of these training plans for for safety and for things like that. Is that right? Yes, yeah. me. <laughs> That's like, um, and I, 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 and I just thought it was interesting because that opening was really wide open and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm, I, I, that, that came and could come right out there and get us. But I think that's, that's a good explanation about how you have to adapt your training for unique situations. In that particular case, you were dealing with uh, uh, potentially dangerous animals. But how, how about dealing with nocturnal animals, for example? I, I have some video that I'd like to share with our viewers that you provided of uh, some uh, pygmy slow loris training. And in case people don't know what the heck that is, talk a little bit about that while we watch this video. Yeah, so these are pygmy slow loris. Um, so they're small primates um, and adorable. Um, and they are nocturnal. So in the zoo world, we do something called a reverse light cycle, which means that their nighttime, um, which is their active period, is during our daytime so that our guests um, can be able to watch our, these animals and be active when they're active. Um, and so that's why you're seeing this red light everywhere. The red light does not really affect their um, circadian rhythm, which is why we're able to use that red light. Um, and so in this video, we're training this loris to go into this pod, which is that PVC that you see, kind of that white PVC in the middle there. Um, and we're training, I think this is the male, to go in um, for a few reasons. He already knew this behavior so that we could move him if needed. So it's the same as a crate behavior for a dog. Um, but then we decided we had this challenge that came up where we wanted to try to give a lot of our animals at the zoo COVID vaccines, which came available. They're specially made for animals. Um, and we had the opportunity to distribute those to certain species that were at higher risk. Um, and so we thought about how we could do this in a more voluntary way. Um, and I don't remember who had the idea, but the idea came up of seeing if we could train them to be comfortable with us injecting them um, in their rear end area. And they're super small, so it was a little bit um, iffy if this was gonna be a safe thing to do, but we talked to our vets and they felt it would be com they were comfortable doing it. Um, and so we already used this behavior that this animal knew very well and was very comfortable doing. Um, and found that the perfect position was right there when he stuck his little leg out. Um, and so we worked on that. And then we were able to desensitize him to being touched with soft things and then eventually worked our way up to a needle. And I'm happy to report that both lorises that we have did fantastic um, with their vaccines. That looks really cool watching watching the way they, they, they I saw that needle go in and, and they're doing the descent. I assume this is the desensitization process, yes, right? It's not yeah, the real thing. Not yeah. the real thing, yeah. Now, uh, I'm very familiar with working in the zoological world, but when you when the video first started, uh, it, it it said, I think, 0 0.1, okay. and I think there's another part of the video that says 1.0, and what does that mean for those that, that, that don't work in the zoo industry? What does it mean when you say 1.0 or 0 0.1 or 2.3? Yeah, it's just indicating if it's a male or a female and how many animals are in the group. So this video is showing right now the female, so point the 
the number that comes after the point is a female and if it's beforehand it's the male so in this particular group because it said 0 0.1 it's indicating that it's one female if it said 2.1 that'd be two males and one female exactly right. and we we they do live together but when we train them we separate right. them yeah. so I just thought maybe some of our viewers might not understand that shorthand, so that would be helpful. So is this uh, the same behavior? Is it, uh, is it just with the device in a different position? Yep, same behavior, different animal, and just in a different position. And you, the female is a bit slower, as you can see. Um, their name is funny. They're called pygmy slow lorises, but they can actually be very fast. But she likes to play into the slow part of her species. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to call me slow, I will be slow. Yes. <laughs> So as you can see, we want that leg to hang out there um, because that gives us a good position for um, the injection site that we wanted to use. And, and often when we when people watch training like this, they often are curious about what the reinforcer is. What, what are you actually uh, using as a reinforcer? Yeah, we are using um, crickets and worms, which they love. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And and is you know, when, when, when you work in a large organization like the Lincoln Park Zoo, I would imagine that uh, occasionally you end up working with species that maybe you've never actually worked with before. So what kind of prep work do you have to do if you're going to go in and, and help advise them on a training plan? What, what, what preparation do you do on your own or how do you get up to speed on a species you've not worked with. Yeah, so the keepers that I work with are the experts um, within their species and with the behavior of the individual animals. And so I really rely on them and I ask them a ton of questions. Um, but when I first started at the zoo in this position, I did do a lot of re background research um, just on general species, just so I had some basic information about those animals. Um, but I'm always growing and that's one of the things I love the most about my job is that I get to learn so much about so many different species and I'm not an expert expert in any species, but I am uh, expert in behavior. And it's so great to see um, how it it's the same for every single species you work with. So. And I, that's one of the wonderful things that I agree that I think when I've worked in a zoo world for so long, it's really made me appreciate the fact that Oh, it really is the same as you apply it to a dwarf caiman, then you apply it to a bird, and then you apply it to a mammal. You really begin to see those techniques really take hold, and that's really kind of cool. Hey, you know what, Juliana, do you want to join us for a few minutes? We still have a, a five or six minutes before Allison's time is up, and I was just curious if you or any of our viewers had questions for Allison. Yeah, Stephen is wondering, how did Allison go about introducing positive-based method, methods to keepers? Was anybody, I'm curious to add on to that, was anybody like, well, when are we going to punish them, you know? <laughs> um, I think the... the um culture of positive training is already very strong and was very strong when I started in my position. Um, so it's not that I need to convince people too much that we should be using these methods. It's more about just teaching them the science um, and showing them how we can use these methods to help um, our animals participate in their own care, which is really our goal um, in the zoo world. Excellent. That's, that's, yeah. that's, really, that's really well said. Yeah. Any other questions out there? So uh, kind of following up to that, I'm curious, knowing what we know about how important good mechanics are and how long it can take to build good mechanics, especially for a new trainer, are you able to get these, the kind of the species specific staff up to speed on mechanics? How do you usually do that to make sure that the training is efficient? Yeah. And, and can I add on to that? Yeah. I mean, not only how do you do it, but it would, I would imagine that sometimes when you're working with different species, because the food is different and the receptacle that it comes from is might be different, that it, they may actually be totally different mechanics. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, they are totally different. And I think, I, I guess I take for granted that a lot of the keepers already kind of have the skill set because they work with these animals every day. But a funny story is I don't have these mechanics for every single species. So I was working with our lions one day and I was struggling <laughs> and the keepers were trying to help me. And I actually had to take a break and kind of work on my mechanics before stepping up in front of that animal again to be able to set that animal up for success and also reduce my frustration in not being able to deliver the food that was needed to be delivered. And 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 did you did you get that frustration from the lion, or were you seeing the animal be frustrated a little bit? Um, the lion I was working with was being very patient with me, good. but um, and I think the keeper set me up in that way, knowing that I was not going to be great with my mechanics. So she gave me an animal that was a little bit more patient. But definitely, if I kept going, he probably yeah. would have been pretty frustrated. <laughs> uh, I've, I've had a lot of terrible situations myself. I remember I was 
I was overseeing the training at the Shedd Aquarium, but I didn't work with our little marmosets, these little monkeys that we worked with. And they invited me to come in and do a session. And I responded to the monkeys the way I do with some of my other animals. I said, yay, you did good. And they all ran to the top of the trees and it took a week for them to come back down again. And I thought, oh, stupid, stupid mistake. And that was just another one of those things where you know, every animal's different. You really have to learn their preferences and what's good and what's reinforcing and what isn't. Yeah. That was that was a, a, a hard lesson learned for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, Juliana? We're almost out of time, but we do have time. We can ask one more question if you have uh, a question or you know what? Well, I thought of something, you know what? Uh, Allison actually provided us with another <laughs> video that I wasn't gonna show, but I yeah. thought maybe you guys would be really interested in seeing some work that uh, that she did with the Inca terns. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what's going on in this session. Um, so yeah, so this is Inca tern training. So Inca terns are a type of bird, they're a seashore bird. Um, and we have a lot of them. And one of the things that we were struggling with this video, video was, um, and so we started station training. So these little shapes that you see on the railing there, um, each one of them has their own shape. So they're really a sick color because they're all the same shape. They're all squares, just so it's easier to rest them out in the wind. Um, and so we started doing this training a long time ago and they're all really participating very well. Um, and a few interesting things that I've seen over the course of time is that we don't actually use a whistle bridge anymore. Um, our bridge for these birds is just our reaching into the um, cup to grab the, the worm that we're feeding them. And the reason I decided to stop that or stop using a whistle bridge was mainly for the keepers that were working with these animals um, because I, the mechanics for them was a little difficult. They weren't as practiced at the time with training these animals and they were watching our hands. Um, and so we kind of picked up on that and we were able to just quickly, easily change our bridge to just reaching into the, into the um, cup that we were holding the bugs in. And I like that. I like that adaptation. And for those that, that aren't used to the term bridge, it's just a, a word that we use in the zoo community to mean the marker, the clicker, the whistle, et cetera. But I think that's, and it's, it's one of the challenges that you know that a lot of dog trainers have is that they tend to rest their hand on the treat pouch so the clicker becomes meaningless. So I think it was very wise when working with the keepers who were going to have their hands in the, uh, at the, at the pouch or at the food delivery station or at the bucket, uh, you just made that into the marker and 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 did you have to work though on then teaching the keepers to be very conscious of when they put their hand at the at the at the entrance at the top of the of the feed bucket um i a little bit but not really i think everybody picked up on it really quickly and i really think it was because the birds were already listening to that to that signal that sure. we were giving them and they weren't paying attention to the whistle <laughs> excellent excellent well i i really really appreciate you uh being here with us today i know we've got a class going on at the same time i'm gonna let allison rejoin her classmates but thank you so much for joining us on live from the ranch it's been really great having you here and uh maybe we can have you back sometime the training is fun to watch and that was really cool yeah